Check, check. Check, check. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. We're going to get ready to begin in just a second. I want a quick, quick note for you is that uh, we are uh, inside wearing masks today as our policy dictates as a church. So unless you're eating, if you would, please wear a mask. And when you're eating, that's fine to take your mask off, eat, dr eat and drink. But as soon as you complete uh, eating and drinking, please return your mask on for the safety of everyone who's here. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Welcome to Faith in the 21st Century 2021. For those who don't know, know me and who may uh, be visitors with us today, my name is Ben Boswell. I'm a senior minister here at Myers Park Baptist Church. And on behalf of our congregation, we welcome you. We are so honored to have you here with us today as we begin this exciting weekend of learning and exploring and expanding our faith. Faith in the 21st century, as formerly known as Jesus in the 21st century, or J21, is a yearly lecture series where we invite the leading biblical and theological voices of the 21st century to join us for a weekend to share their scholarship and to help expand our faith and practice. F21, Faith in the 21st Century, is made possible by generous gifts from our church endowment, as well as the labor of Reverend Mia McLean, support staff, and the Ministry of Spiritual Growth. This year, we are thrilled to welcome author, priest, and professor, the Reverend Will Gaffney, Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney. She is the Right Reverend Samuel B. Hulsey Professor of Hebrew Bible at Bright Divinity School in Fort Worth, Texas. She is an Episcopal priest, canonically resident in the Diocese of Pennsylvania and licensed in the Diocese of Fort Worth, a former Army chaplain and congregational pastor in the AME Zion Church. Also a former member, and I'm going to get this pronunciation messed up here, in the Dorsche Derek Reconstructionist Mignon of the Germantown Jewish Center in Philadelphia. How did I do? Not bad, not bad. <laughs> Maybe I could have done better on that one. She is the author of Womanist Midrash, a reintroduction to the women of Torah and of the throne, a commentary on Nahum, Habakkuk, and Zephaniah, Daughters of Miriam, Women Prophets in Ancient Israel, a co-editor of the People's Bible and the People's Companion to the Bible, and her newest books, A Women's Lectionary for the Whole Church, Year W and Year A, which is an alternative to the revised common lectionary of readings for worship that is more expansive and inclusionary as a lectionary that remedies the androcentric male-dominated lection by introducing people to women's stories in scripture. A women's lectionary for the whole church, in my opinion, as I watch my friends online, is sweeping the nation amongst clergy. Almost every pastor that I know has purchased this, these two books, Year W and Year A, and is preparing to implement them in this new lectionary in their churches beginning this Advent. Uh, but we, we are excited to have the brilliant biblical scholar and theologian who created this lectionary here with us this year as our Faith in the 21st Century speaker. Will you join me in welcoming our 2021 Faith in the 21st Century, the Reverend Dr. Will Gaffney. mumble a bit and ask how you're hearing me in the back. Sounds like we're working on it. Uh, sounds like we are just about right. Again, thank you, Pastor Boswell, and thank you, uh, Reverend Mia McLean and Reverend Tara Gibbs uh, for your hospitality and uh, helping me and uh, Scooter, my new pet, uh, overcome uh, the challenges of the last couple of weeks since I increased the number of ankle bones I have by one. <laughs> it is a delight to be here with you and share this project that has uh, been so important to me, uh, not only in light of the Revised Common Lectionary, but as an Episcopal priest in light of the Episcopal Lectionary. So today we're going to talk in our first session about the making of this lectionary, uh, why the making of this lectionary was so important uh, to me and I believe to and for the church. And as we have our conversation today, 
I invite you to be in conversation with those in the wider world. Uh, I, I don't remember if the streaming is simulcast or will come later, but there are always people on Twitter looking for a word. So for those of you who do tweet, you will find hashtags at the bottom of most of the slides. And for those of you who are new to tweeting, uh, remember that apostrophes don't work, so women's lectionary uh, will not have that apostrophe, grammar be darned. <laughs> All right. So my primary mode of biblical scholarship has turned out to be translation studies. Uh, from a very young person, I was interested in language. I was exposed to Spanish very young. Um, I say somewhat sadly, I have learned and forgotten Spanish more times than any other language. I'm going on my third cycle. There, there's always some in my head, but it doesn't keep as well as the languages that came after. And I was interested in the original languages of the biblical text as soon as I realized that there were original languages. Um, and I'm very grateful to my parents for providing me the kind of upbringing that uh, sent me to Europe as a little person and then later as a larger person um, that I might have uh, friends and connections with people who spoke different languages and understand that languages are complex and do not flow easily between each other. So I think of this project in terms of things uh, translation in terms of the actual translation of the scriptures and in terms of uh, translating women back into the text. Uh, in some places they are there, in some places they are not visible. So I would like you to take some time and look at these translations of what is Psalm 68, uh, verse 11 in Hebrew, verse 12 in uh, Bibles that are, are generally they're numbered by Christians, and invite you, if you uh, have, have Bibles, and I cackle widely on the inside, knowing that my fellow Episcopalians uh, don't necessarily car carry Bibles or even have them in the pews often, uh, and uh, that lots of Protestants don't have Bibles, but some of you carry digital texts. But I invite you to look at these, look at any text you might have with you, and consider the differences. And as we go forward, I am going to ask you to, to take your notes and write your questions. We will do uh, larger questioning periods at the end and not be able to take many as we go along. So having considered these, consider this. So think about the differences that the translation choices make. Now, some of you are familiar with Handel's Messiah. And some of you know that there's a line in there about the company of preachers. That line comes from this psalm. Now I'm gonna do what is always terrifying in a presentation and go backwards. There is a professor of homiletics at Duke uh, Department of Religion uh, Divinity School. The graduate program in religion is between the two. Uh, he may have retired by now, but he, he was there when I was in school, Dr. Dick Lisher. And he published a book on preaching and used the language of company of preachers from Handel's Messiah, which in turn comes from this text, as his title. And I asked him, once I looked at the book, why there were male preachers in his book. And you know, he sort of ruffled up a bit. And I said, well, you picked a text in which there are no male preachers, right? But you wouldn't know that if you read the King James, which is where the language of company of preachers comes from. Um, you wouldn't know it from the NRSV, which is supposed to be um, 
suitable for church proclamation and study in the academy. It's being revised. I'll be interested to see what they do with this verse. Um, the Common English Bible is even newer than the New Revised Standard Version. And let me say of the Common English Bible, uh, it is an important watershed uh, coming in uh, the 2000s because it marks the first time in publication of a major uh, scholarly and ecclesial Bible in the English language that included people of color on the translating team. Not until the year 2000 of Our Lady and non-binary divine beings has there been even one person of color of any marginalized ethnicity on the teams that translate Bibles into English, which is why we suffered with black but beautiful for so long because the people who translated the song uh, operating out of a white supremacist framework uh, did not believe it was possible to be black and beautiful Therefore, the text had to be wrong as it was, and the conjunction was replaced with a disjunction, which is why so many Bibles would say things like black but lovely, lovely in spite of being black. Uh, JPS, this is Jewish Publication Society, and the IB is the inclusive Bible. When people ask me what are the translations of the Bible I recommend, it is this list, even though they're not doing great with this verse. And this is still the best of the lot. So one of the ways in which women need to be translated back into the text to use my language is in the act of translation. Because of the way in which biblical languages are gendered, groups of people can be identified by gender in some circumstances. Think about the way we use the ESS suffix. I'm going to use it with prophet. So we have prophet and prophetess and prophets and prophetesses. In English, contemporarily, our gendered language is in transition so that we often will celebrate actors at the Academy Awards. And those mean that word would then include anyone who has a professional acting part without regard to gender uh, genderful, genderqueer, non-binary. But if we say the actresses have nice gowns, then we mean people who are uh, socially constructed as female, not that people who are socially constructed as male cannot wear nice gowns, because God bless you, uh, Brother uh, Billy what, Porter, uh, for those beautiful gowns uh, in honor of uh, Hector uh, Extravaganza, who died uh, just before the pandemic. So in this passage, the women who bring the good news is a feminine plural like prophetesses that cannot hold anybody who's socially or biologically constructed as male. So as I told Professor Lisher, it's not possible for there to be male prophets in there. But when we have categories that are prophets or actors or doctors, then those categories can be full of people of a variety of constructions. Which is why I asked uh, Reverend Mia to make you the copy of this particular excerpt of my first book, Daughters of Miriam, which is a study of women prophets in the Hebrew Bible and in the ancient Near East. And the argument I was making is the common sense argument that we know, that when old-fashioned translations of the Bible would say the sons of Israel were, li were liberated from Egypt, we knew that the daughters of Israel went with them, right? And that they were using that masculine, inclusive language to cover everybody, but some people were hidden. So I began translating the people of Israel the Israelites, which is what you'll find in some other Bibles. Uh, but I began to break it down and say, the women, children, and men of Israel. And so uh, that type of translation came through into this project. So when we would have a story that allowed us to di dismiss people as people, you know, Joshua smote the Canaanites in the village of Ai. But 
If we say that Joshua struck to death the women, children, and men of Canaan in the village of Ai, then we have to sit with the violence of that story in a way that we can't easily dismiss it. While functionally those two translations are telling you the same thing, the way they're telling it to you not only makes the people behind the grammatical structure more visible, um, it also calls us to account for them. So in the handout, I was demonstrating by translation that there are places where it is clear that when God or a prophet is talking about the work of prophecy, they're talking about everyone. And since there are women prophets, like Miriam and Huldah and Noajah and Isaiah's baby mama, and that's a whole story, that when God says something like, I have warned you through every prophet and every seer, what God is saying is I have warned you through every woman prophet and every male prophet to stop doing whatever the heck it is you're doing, right? And so in those cases, I would pull those translations apart and include, you know, every prophet under the sun, every short prophet, every tall prophet, every bald prophet, every female prophet, every male prophet, every prophet who was doing right on the side, every prophet who was doing wrong on the side. So when I talk about gender expansive language in this lectionary, that is the kind of thing that I need. And in every case, it is rooted in a grammatical form that exists in the biblical text and is coded to either uh, have women explicitly, women and girls, like uh, those who proclaim the good news here, or uh, implicitly like the Israelites, the Canaanites, the people of Ammon. Now, one of the things that has excited and frustrated me as a translator uh, who started uh, as a feminist because I was introduced to feminism quite young and later would situate myself as a womanist, is the ways in which the feminist axiom that women have to keep reinventing the world continues to be true. So whether you are doing faith in the 21st century or in the previous century when I got my theological education, people in the church have been wrestling with God language and with the roles of women uh, in the church because of not simply what the text says or what people think the text says or what people think the text means when it says, but also because of how it's been translated. One of the conversations the church has had and been quite vicious about is who can proclaim the gospel? Who can be an evangelist? Well, the first testament uh, was in Hebrew, but it's also in Greek because of the diaspora of the Jews to North Africa. And North African Jews used Greek normatively because of the conquest activities of Alexander the Great. This is Hellenism in one sentence. And when this text is translated in Greek, preserved in Greek, the both in Hebrew and in Greek, the word, the women who proclaim the good news is a single word in each language. And in Greek, it's a, a word that, uh, well, I now I have to go backwards again. You might be familiar with, euangelizamenos. Uh, that is the word where we get evangel and the gospel. So this practice of proclaiming gospel is not a New Testament practice. It is actually a cultural practice in ancient Israel where after the war or after a battle, young women would go out, receive the, the army, hopefully with celebration and dances if that was called for, but as town criers also proclaim the news from town to town. And so that proclamation of the good news, that evangel, that word that would come to mean uh, preacher, in the New Testament, preacher of gospel, preacher of the gospel of Jesus. That was a women's occupation in the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and so that word uh, that comes to describe a category from which women would be excluded was a women's word. And so it matters who translates and it matters how they translate 
because um, we wouldn't be having some of the conversations that we are having or have had to have every cycle. I did a bit of this in the beginning of Womanist Midrash where I talked about how God introduces God's self or is introduced by the narrator of the Hebrew Bible, first in masculine language, Bereshit uh, Elohim, uh, when beginning, he, God, created. But then in the very next verse, Veruach Elohim uh, and she, the spirit, was fluttering uh, over the waters. And so that we have God presented with, in binary gender, because Hebrew is a binary language, and it's the way people thought about the world, sort of a chicken and egg thing. And then God goes on to create uh, humanity in the divine image, and the, div the divine reflecting creation is male and female. And so we have from the very beginning, from the very literally first page of the Bible, we have masculine and feminine language used for God, but we have a sort of conspiratorial approach to translation that never uses the feminine pronoun for the spirit, uh, even though that is the only grammatically possible pronoun. And so what you'll see in your Bibles is the spirit did, the spirit move. And so they'll just keep repeating the words the spirit and use the proper noun rather than the pronoun. So the reader will never know how it's gendered. And, and at the same time, you'll be called to account in some congregations for a creed uh, that uses masculine language for the spirit, uh, which is downright unbiblical. <laughs> so now I'd like you to reflect on that translation of Psalm 68 in larger context. Now, uh, some of you have uh, lectionaries with you, and I, I meant to sort of do some sorting. Let me ask, at which tables are there lectionaries? And it doesn't matter which year this piece is gonna be in both. So, all right, so let's, so let's go the other way. Clancy, y'all didn't bring like, oh, okay, I was about to say. All right, so let's go the other way. What table does not have any? One over there, can anybody help me see? One back there, is that, is that two tables, is that correct? Uh, so we're, we're going to share. Oh, y'all are better than me sharing your books with people. Because y'all will get to see all of my other sides after this project if I did not get my books back. Y'all would know things about me you did not want to know. So that side uh, received a generous loan, and, we, and this side. So if, so we're going to look at how I use that psalm for the Feast of Mary Magdalene, which is one of my favorite feasts. And so if you are in year W, which is orange, you're going to find it on, uh, why do I not understand what, okay, you're gonna find it on page 246. Year W, page 246. If you're in year A, which is goldenrod, you're gonna find it on page 239. In the lectionary, proper feasts uh, maintain the same readings. So the readings for Christmas are gonna be the same every year for Christmas, the readings for Easter, uh, which helped me a lot because there comes a point where I get to copy and paste from lectionary to lectionary. So please uh, uh, read aloud at your tables or read in your own copy if you're sitting by yourself. Read those four passages of scripture, paying attention to how uh, they interweave, thinking particularly about Psalm 68.
okay, I'm going to add another layer to your assignment. So you've been looking at how those lessons read in reference to Mary Magdalene for her festal day. Now I want you to think about how that psalm can function in another set of readings. So if you are in year W, you're going to look at page 15, which is the Christmas one reading. That would be the same, you have Christmas one in, uh, well, never mind. Year W is going to do Christmas one, page 15. I want year A to do, why does this, why do I have several different things going? Okay, both, uh, year A is also page 15. They haven't gotten far apart yet. So that's one place to look. The next place to look is year W, here's where it splits again, uh, page 216 for proper four, year W, uh, to page 216 for proper four, and then year A, page 88 for Lent five. I want you to look at how those texts are fitting together. And now having talked terribly about people who didn't bring theirs, mine are in my laptop, but because I've got the, the slideshow going, Mia, I'm gonna ask to borrow two. <laughs> See, it always comes back to you. It always comes back. Because after what we went through, I don't want to uh, unplug the screen and go dig it in my laptop. I'm just like, no, which is normally what I would do. Thank you.
So as we prepare to go on, I'm going to just poll the house, starting with the passages for the Feast of Mary Magdalene. For how many of you were any one, two, three, or four of those passages new that you had not read them before? Some of them. So I see some, I see some hands. Go ahead and raise them high. You're not alone. There are other hands. Other, other people are doing this. I can see all the hands. So there are hands. Some of those are new texts. And that's part of what I hope to do with the lectionary is to have congregations and preachers read more widely. Um, same question for Christmas one. Anything new in there? Okay. Okay. Uh, and then the other texts, uh, you had separate texts for those. Okay. So now I'm going to talk a little bit about the mechanics of lectionary making. And then we're going to talk much more widely about uh, your experience reading just those sections and your questions and comments. I've been using the expression translation matters from the very beginning of my uh, academic career because uh, it's such a wonderful uh, double entendre. So I use it to say that translation does indeed matter but I also use it to present the translation matters of a particular text or translation. It is important for Christians, particularly, to come to terms with, and one, to, to know, acknowledge, and then come to terms with what it means that for the majority you read your sacred text in translation by someone you don't know whose translation methodologies, theories, and practices you don't know, whose commitments you don't know. I find it very helpful in Islam that Quran is only Quran in Arabic. If it is in English, or French or German. It is a translation of Quran. And that distinguishing language provides a necessary separation to account for uh, what I have been using more broadly under the expression of translator artifact, all of the things that happen. I mean, I can just tell you stories about times where I've seen a preacher go in hard on one word in a verse and it's a word that's not actually there in the original text, but it's a word that maybe uh, helps to make it grammatically appropriate in English, or in some cases, doesn't really need to be there, but that was just sort of the vibe the translator was going with. Uh, or other times where a word is really harmful. Or, you know, uh, I grew up uh, in the black church, I learned to preach in the black church, and I'm willing to bet that everybody who spent more than a passing sojourn in the black church has heard some version of, don't put a question mark where God puts a period. Um, but, you know, we're talking about languages that don't have punctuation, so how are we getting there? So let's talk about translation matters um, that have been, that have occupied me my, my entire career. There is a translator's appendix in Womanist Midrash. It was written as a uh, translator's preface, uh, but the press was terrified it would scare people, uh, and so they put it in the back. You're, if you're this far, you're already, you're already sold on the book if you're you know, back in the appendices was the way that they were thinking of it. And I have had more than one person say, you know, this would work really well as a preface. Mm -hmm. So. I should tell you that part of my background is in science. My undergrad degree is in science. My first career was as a research biologist. My first publication uh, on a team was in Journal of Experimental Hematology. It is very much the way I think about the world uh, in terms of science and data and uh, demonstrable effect. So you know this whole thing that we've been going through for probably the last six to eight years about uh, you know, uh, facts that aren't really facts, choose your facts, um, 
make up your own science. You know, I have, you know, I have, my teeth have been itching for six years. Lots of people's teeth are itching, um, but I've, I've just had particularly scientifically itchy teeth um, for a while. Translation is often misunderstood as word matching. You've got a word in your originating language, and you've got words in your target language, and one of these words is going to be a fit or a better fit for your originating word. But translation is art as much as it is science. So just focusing on translating from Hebrew to English, Hebrew is a small language, biblical Hebrew. One, there's four Hebrew languages, biblical Hebrew, rabbinic Hebrew, liturgical Hebrew, modern Hebrew, we, we could probably say five, medieval Hebrew. The only source of biblical Hebrew is the Hebrew Bible. There are graffito in the ancient world some of which are Hebrew-ish. You know, there's a whole argument as to whether Hebrew is even Hebrew or just a sub-dialect of Canaanite. But the whole source material is the Hebrew Bible. So if a word doesn't exist because a woman wasn't using the passive voice to address a group of women, you know, if a verb form doesn't exist in the text, it doesn't exist in the world. Now, we could say what it would most likely be based on how the other verbs function, but we don't have exemplars of biblical Hebrew, right? So we just kind of go with what we got. And we got a lot of help with it with Canaanite when uh, the texts at Ur that tell us the stories of the gods like uh, Baal and Mot and Asherah, and, you know, they kill each other and come back from the dead and you know, all of their adventures like Greek gods. Those stories are the closest language to biblical Hebrew, so that helped us fill out some things. And then, uh, when the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in the late 50s, just as the RSV was uh, being completed, um, they had to start all over again with a new RSV, which is why we have the NRSV. It is a post-Dead Sea Scroll Bible. Uh, and some, what, 80 changes made to the NRSV uh, from the Dead Sea Scrolls alone, not counting translation choices as culture has evolved. So you have this group of, very small group of words, and some have said that there's 50 words in English to every one word in Hebrew. We keep inventing words, so it's hard to keep track of that. But every word has a semantic range. It can mean lots of different things. Words can also change their meaning contextually. And so when you're dealing with written language which has no inflection, and you have on the blackboard, Dr. Gaffney is cool. Does that mean you're my greatest fan or that you're going to get me a sweater? <laughs> How do you know without the context, right? So on the science side, you have these words and these words that are related to these words and the semantic fields around these words and the grammatical uh, situations in which these words can change meaning. So. I'm teaching Hebrew right now, and I'm always telling my students, well, this is more of a philosophical issue, right? Does biblical Hebrew have tenses? It certainly doesn't have a present tense. Modern Hebrew had to invent a present tense from the participle using it like a gerund. And if your tense can change and go the other way when you add a conjunction, is that even a tense? Is that what tenses do, right? So we have all these questions about how the grammar works. So there is, a, there is a science part, but there is an art part. And uh, whether I'm good at it or not, I have the soul of a poet. I wrote poetry like, like lots of angsty teenagers, right? Uh, but I also wrote some good poetry, but I think about uh, the richness of literature uh, when I translate. So there's a place where the prophet Miriam gets struck by somebody, there's lots of masculine pronouns going around, and her skin becomes diseased and becomes flaky like snow. White supremacist translators uh, inserted the word white there, uh, it's not there, um, uh, and made that to be she was 
turned white because she was upset about Moses's black wife, but they were all Afro-Asiatic, so that doesn't really work. But when that happened, uh, you'll read the prayer for her healing will be something like this in the New Revised Version. Um, Hear God uh, and restore her, right? But in Hebrew, I want you to listen to the sort of vowel sound. It's el na rafa na la. So the restore her just doesn't get you at it. And so when I translate that, I translate that as hear, holy one, hear and heal her. And so I use all of those H's to get the ah sound that's at the end of Hebrew, right? So that's the art part. So when I translate, I'm looking to be as precise as possible and I'm very invested in euphony, what it sounds like. Now, there's different kinds of translation for different contexts. What I'm doing in the women's lectionary is, as I've mentioned to you, uh, gender expansive. It is gender expansive in a particular way that my other projects are not. So as you were reading, you noticed that in the Psalms, I use the feminine pronoun for God when it is not called for by the text. I do that because this is a churchly project, and one of my aims is for people not only to be introduced to biblical characters and a wider assortment of women's stories, but to hear themselves or hear people who are not them uh, reflected in the divine image explicitly. And where we have all failed in our neuter language and inclusive God language is, oh, somebody owes me a dollar or a Dr. Pepper. I take both. Um, Is that we have not dislodged the masculine language. So if a congregation or a liturgy says, well, we're gonna use the language of creator and provider and sustainer, we have all this rich language, uh, God who loves. There's wonderful language in the world What happens is that people who are fundamentally rooted in a masculine image of God just simply hear father as creator, father as provider, father as God who loves. And that's not a bad thing in and of itself, but what it means is that their entire God construct is centered around the dominant subspecies of the human population. And so, women cannot be fully in the image of God when God is so fundamentally and profoundly tied to one human gender. It might be different if the pronoun for God were, in, were a different gender than either of the primary genders of human beings, but that's not how English works. That can happen in some other languages, but I'm translating in English. So I wanted people to come to terms with what it means to hear God as either the gender in which they identify or for perhaps the first time in their lives, not hear God in the gender for which they identify if they're a male person for whom the masculine construction of God is normative. So I did that in the Psalms, which which is not literal. But when I do this, You know, I explain to the reader what I'm doing in the preface of the volume. So there's art and science. Um, There are a number of other things I do in translation that I'll take up later. Uh, Let me say something about this word poesis before I move on. Uh, Poesis is the art of creation. That's what poetry is, it's the root. Uh, But it's also biologically how your body makes stuff. Your body makes blood cells, hematopoiesis. And when your body makes stuff, it's not making it out of nothing. It's making making it out of other stuff in your body, things that you have eaten and broken down and things that that are there. So thinking about translation as poesis, as an act of creation, uh, creative like poetry, but also out of the root elements of the scriptures themselves. So who translates God's words? I already told you that uh, people of uh, minoritized people uh, had been systematically excluded from translation of biblical projects through larger systems, social structures, like when did uh, folk of a variety of ethnic and racial backgrounds 
have PhD training in uh, Bible, in either Testament, in languages, and have sufficient prominence that they would be considered or invited to participate in a project is just as much part of the problem as who's on the list and who's not on the list. There is a very funny story about how women uh, participated in the New Revised Standard Version. Uh, Catherine Dube Sackenfeld told me this story that um, the men had decided they were gonna have a woman on the team and were feeling quite proud of themselves. Uh, and they called, and uh, I'm not gonna call the names of the other uh, women scholars, but they kibbutzed and they said, yeah, we're not doing the token thing. And so when the men called, they said, that's nice. Uh, you need more than one woman. I said, well, all right. Went off and called another woman because they were not planning to do that. And lo and behold, these women had all talked to each other. And because of all of the, the structural things I just laid out, there wasn't that many of them, right? So uh, I think we wound up with two in the Hebrew Bible, uh, one, maybe two in the New Testament. But that was, but that was you know, activism biblical translation activism uh, to get beyond uh, one woman, and of course, in that context, we mean uh, white women. So who translates God's words? We have Bibles in our pews, uh, in our digital devices, that people don't know who translated, don't know who was gatekeeping, who was at the table, and who's out of the table. Um, biblical translation is largely done um, people with academic credentials who are also affiliated uh, with the church. While there are certainly biblical scholars and biblical linguistic scholars uh, who, did, who uh, do not work with church or synagogue, um, by and large, the desire to preserve this text, to keep it accessible, to correct translation, comes from people who are using it uh, religiously to some degree, whatever their own personal uh, relationship with a deity with a congregation or community might be, but they come out of this tradition. And so what that has meant for Christians, for Western Christians, has meant that there's also an entire raft of anti-Semitic issues in translation that I address in the lectionary. So uh, we know everybody on the page is a Jew. We also know there's conflict, intra-Jewish conflict, at the time the gospels and epistles are written that it's not necessarily there in the time in which they're set. And it reads very differently when a Jewish person says the Jews are doing whatever is happening than when a non-Jewish person says it. In fact, in our culture, when somebody says the Jews with the the, that is generally the forerunner to something very unpleasant and inappropriate. So in the New Testament, I use Judeans because Yudaoi means a person from the place of Judah. It means a person who practices the ancestral religion of Judah, which we call Judaism as it has evolved. Uh, but sometimes it even means Jewish Christian as opposed to Gentile Christian. So it means lots of different things. So I'm very careful about how I use that language. And I was also very careful about which gospels I used where. And so I'm using John very lightly. There will be no blood libel, you know, his blood be on us and on our children. Like we're not reading that on Good Friday. We're not reading that on Palm Sunday because historically the church has read that and then gone out and committed atrocities against Jewish people. So uh, part of who translates means that as a Christian, I have a responsibility to Judaism because as a Christian, I have cultural privilege um, in the way that I do not as a woman, in the way that I do not as a black person. But we can have privilege and peril at the same time in our body, but depending on who we are and what we're uh, constructed of and how we're constructed. So I'm, I'm very particular uh, about how I treat uh, the language of Jews uh, and Judaism in the New Testament. So who translates. We have scholars, we have scholars who are related to church, related uh, to synagogue. In individual commentaries, you'll have you know, a biblical scholar providing a translation to go along. 
But what I realized by spending so much time uh, in synagogue is that there are things that people hear who know language, who know the biblical languages that other folk don't hear. And the culture in many synagogues is that Tat Shabbat is Hebrew class, right? Lots of Jewish kids are just learning Hebrew. They're learning their alphabet as they're learning their alphabet. You know, they're, they're just learning to navigate the language in a way that we are not. And so it seems to be set up to be an elite practice when language doesn't have to be elite, right? Uh, because spoken language is accessible to most people and then written language can be accessible to people who learn to read. Um, so we have just an artificial structure around biblical languages and who translates. Um, I have always translated as a preacher. Um, I always translated the old lectionary cycle, all for lessons. Um, that was always my practice because language is just so flexible. So I invite you to think about uh, who translates the scriptures you have access to uh, and what it means that you don't have access to them. Right? Sometimes you can find a list online, who was the translation committee for the such and such Bible? Um, but not often. Okay, let's see where we are in my time. Okay, already. Uh, gender matters. Uh, it matters who translates, it matters how they translate, the, the gender rules of a language matter. So for example, because of this business of the gender of the spirit and the way that Greek works and the spirit is always neuter, that means when Jesus was saying things about uh, leaving us the spirit, he couldn't fix his lips to use a masculine pronoun if he wanted to. Like that's just not the way the language worked. And so we're kind of robbed of hearing Jesus talk about the spirit using the feminine grammar that would be native to him whether he was speaking Aramaic, which he would have been, or if he were reading Torah and using Hebrew. Um, the long list of translation practices is in the front of both of these lectionaries. I do expand genealogies, so instead of, say, perhaps the God of Jacob, um, the God of the line of Rebekah. And after the translations, uh, there's a text commentary where I talk about what I've done uh, so that people can see what, you know, what has happened. Uh, sometimes things are in brackets if I've added th to them. Um, so for example, I talk about and have preached about Jesus uh, as the son of David and Bathsheba and the difference that makes, right? Uh, theologically, the claim about Jesus as the son of David is about monarchy and power and hierarchy and legitimacy. But every time they tried to crown Jesus, he said, I don't want that. That's not what I'm here for. It's actually not that kind of, he did use the word kingdom, I don't use the word kingdom. It's not that kind of kingdom, it's not that kind of party. But Jesus was with the Bathsheba type women. He was with, uh, with women who had scandal associated with their names, right? Uh, and so he functioned as the son of Bathsheba he didn't really function as the son of David. Um, and naming that changes how we engage with him. Um, trying to think, it, uh, I don't use Lord because that is, one, it's hierarchical. Two, it's technically not God's name. It's a substitution for the sacred letters, yud heh vav -He, y -H -W -H, which cannot be pronounced. That's an anti-Semitic practice. There are some projects that spell the name out and you can even hear it in some songs and some things and that's just terrible and grotesque and Christians need to stop that. Um, I don't uh, use that language and I have a whole lexicon of divine language that's available at the end of uh, each volume uh, that you see in the passages. You, you saw some things like um, the Holy One, the Ageless God. There's just a whole collection of those there at the end. And so I know I was supposed to end at 1.15, but we didn't get to talk. So how much time do we have, Mia? What? 15, 15, oh, perfect. So, okay. 
So what I want to hear back from you is going back to your experience of reading. We'll just focus on the Mary Magdalene passages. What was it like to read those scriptures in this translation? For some of you, these were uh, familiar passages. Uh, what was it like for you for those for whom it was unfamiliar? So if the passages were familiar, some of them, what was that like reading these new translations? If it was all unfamiliar, what was that like? And what was it like having those four lessons together as a jumping off place to preach or talk about Mary Magdalene? So those are your three questions. If it was familiar, if it was unfamiliar, and the effect of the whole. Bless you. Now I just got you all 15 to 20 minutes. Okay, well that's helpful. Let me, let me rephrase, rephrase the question. You read these passages for the Feast of Mary Magdalene. Some of you said there were some new Bible verses there, period, you had never seen before. So what was your response to reading these new verses in this translation? Some of you said, I know some of these passages. What was your response to reading passages that you knew in a very different translation? And then the last question is, how do these four passages work together to prepare you to talk about Mary Magdalene? Okay. Um, I'll say that, um, do you know who Cynthia Bourgeau is? I do not. She is a Episcopal um, priest mm -hmm. who is also a public theologian, and she uh, leads a lot of retreats and she's visited this church at our this same kind of series about six or well, eight years ago um, and she has an entire book about Mary Magdalene so a lot of us in this congregation have read that book or heard her talk mm -hmm. and so we're used to looking at it. it's not we're not new uh, a lot of us anyway we're not it's not new to looking at Mary Magdalene in an entirely different way than the traditional way so um, and some of us have grown very comfortable with it as well. So um, that's, that's a good thing, I think. Um, but my, uh, I guess my, my mind has gotten, because I've never really given translation a great deal of thought and energy, was I love your definition of poesis and how that's the definition that's both an art and a science. Mm -hmm. So um, as you describe the, um, those early translators, back in the day as they're looking at it from a white supremacist standpoint. Um, I guess I'm wondering if there was some, if this is some sort of, um, in their process of trying to translate, did they do so from a place of goodwill, but a different kind of consciousness than we have today? Or, you know, if we can, you know, if we can, um, because it gets to the heart of how do you translate, how do you try to really do your best to understand what the intention of the original writers in the original language was. So I don't know if that's something you're... Well, so let me say thank you and invite somebody else to come while, while I respond uh, to you. It's difficult to talk about intent, whether translator or uh, biblical author. Um, there, are some, there are some approaches which are absolutely, let's try to get to their intent because then we're going to get to God's intent. Um, I don't know that we can answer that question. In terms of goodwill, uh, these were all people of faith uh, doing this work out of religious devotion, devotion to God, devotion to the church, uh, but at the same time, uh, believing sincerely that um, you know, the slavery called for in the biblical text was normative and should endure forever, uh, and that some human beings, 
by virtue of plumbing, we're just better and better equipped than other human beings, and there should just absolutely be hierarchy between human beings. Uh, and so uh, I don't know if I wanted to call that uh, well-intended. Uh, I recognize that for some people, um, that's sort of the native theological headspace, but I also recognize that for each one of those movements, there were people in every century who said, yeah, that part's not right. So uh, for me, it's not about well intended, but it does reflect uh, the culture in which they were raised and all of their contributing influences. Oh, huh. mm -hmm. okay, yes, thank you. Do you want me to just wait? Oh, here okay. it is. There. All right. Uh, the, your question. Um, when I look at the psalm on the uh, feast of Mary Magdalene, I'm thinking about Mary Magdalene. I'm thinking about women and the power of women and the um, you know stereotypes associated with women, and particularly the verse that says. Uh, mother to the orphans and defender of the widows, it feels like a very appropriate, beautiful, caring God as that figure. But then when I look at it in the context of the other Sundays, um, we think of, in a biblical sense, typically orphans as children without fathers, and so then is, is mother, it would, would, if it was translated father, as it usually is, is, then we think of the human father replacing God, hmm. you know? So it's put me into sort of this theological spin of, do I want the masculine defender mm -hmm. for, you know, the, uh, the widows and the return of a mother to orphans or do I am I looking for the replacement of or the comforter to so it yeah uh, that's not a question that's just my comment <laughs> no, that, that's part of what I wanted was was your responses oh I don't want please come uh, and after this uh, let me hear your uh, unfiltered re responses just to our conversation because I don't want our time to be just on my questions um, you never know how fruitful a question is going to be. So if you just have a response you want to share about what you've read and what you've heard or a question, you can do that as well, please. How are you doing, sister? I just wanted to give a response. I thank you for uh, calling attention to this verse because I had read it and not read it. And so the language that's presented here is affirming to me as a woman, as a preacher, and it reminds me of the visuals that I encounter in the African-American experience. The women are great who proclaim, or a great army who proclaim the gospel because all I saw was the mothers on the front row. My mm -hmm. mother was a devotional leader, the Sunday school teacher, the lady who gave out the food, the pastor's aid committee. And so the word aligns with my lived experience. Mm -hmm. And I think it's important that language and visuals reflect the lived experience and preach to the people that are looking back at you from the board, and they ought to see themselves in the word, so thank you. Thank you. So more widely, questions, comments. Uh, would you come to the, the mic, you come here and you go there. Don't, you don't have to race, we just, we'll work it out. Having, <laughs> <laughs> been raised in evangelical um, traditions, I thought I was very familiar with Romans, but when I read um, that passage, I thought, how, how much did she stray from the translation? So I looked it up in what would have been familiar to me and just was really surprised that I had no recollection of this whole you know, opening to the letter where he is... Um, giving credit to and thanking you know all of the women in that were critical to the ministry and um and then i had a flashback to a, a church that uh joined um briefly in florida and had asked them met with the senior minister and asked you know, where are the women in the church where are the women thriving in the ministry 
and um, it was a Presbyterian church, and he said, well, you know, we're part of PCA, and so personally, I think that that should happen more, but we don't want to be the ones to rock the boat, and there's just no precedent for it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I wish I could go back down there and <laughs> go over this passage with him, so thank you. Certainly. So th this is one of the primary aims of the lectionary is that it's biblical literacy, right? There's stuff in the Bibles that we simply do not know, right? Um, and I'm going to ask you to consider a different set of language. Uh, not how far did I stray from the translation, but how different is this translation than the translation you were used to? Because I'm not straying from a translation. I'm making choices about translation, some of which are going to be more literal and some of which are going to be more dynamic. Translation is on a, a continuum, formal equivalence to dynamism. And so this is a more dynamic project, that's, that's correct. But it, it's not about string, it's about deliberate choices. And so the, the language we use uh, shapes the conversation. But that's exactly why I wanted that piece. And one New Testament scholar said that if introduction to New Testament textbooks and seminaries started with that passage, rather than the gospels as they tend to do, or other places in the epistle, then the whole conversation about the founding of the Christ movement would be a different conversation, right? Because all of us know the verses where uh, that same Paul said that there was no place for women if they had their mouths open, right? Like we all know those verses, whether we went to seminary or not, but we don't all know this verse, right? You asked how our sense of Mary Magdalene changed. And I think she becomes a stronger woman, a fuller woman. Um, there's a sense of her standing on her own two feet. Uh, and for me, another way to put it would be she becomes a full actor in this story, as opposed to, like at the end of the movie, being listed under uh, the supporting cast or the extras. Uh, she becomes a full woman. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're going to, oh, yes, please, and then we will stop here. Okay. Um, my field before retirement was with young children, and so I was so struck by my different picture here from Psalm 68, 4 through 11, the picture of Mary the mother of orphans and defender of widows is God in her holy habitation, mm -hmm. you know, and on through that, uh, it's just an entirely different picture than I had of what that psalm meant. Yeah. And so in the field of early children, I'm wondering who's doing translating of the materials that our young children get so that they grow up with this picture of um, God and um, the, the, our Christian culture? That's an excellent question. The reality is that uh, Sunday school and Christian education curricula is one of the most conservative parts of religious publishing. And so they are not interested in the work of leading biblical scholars or theologians or even uh, those uh, whose PhDs are in uh, uh, Christian education and curriculum development. Um, it's very hard to find uh, any kind of progressive material. Uh, but we live in an age where people are doing it themselves. And so I have been part of a couple of uh, book projects. One is called Mama God, and it's for, for little littles, uh, where uh, one of my uh, collaborators, uh, the, the artist for the, the cover pieces, has raised her children that way, and one of her daughters just always prays Mama God. And so uh, she just did a collection of her prayers and imagery and little things, uh, and there's uh, uh, there's a book, it might be, What Does God Look Like? But just honestly, in the last few years, with the availability of people to publish themselves, uh, are we starting to see that? But in terms of mass market curriculum, none. Thank you. Pastor Mia, Reverend Mia, to you. Thank you, Dr. Gaffney, for Plenary One.
Um, we're going to take a break here. Um, if you're staying for plenary two, feel free. We have snacks out there. We have restrooms this way. Um, feel free to hang out outside, and then we'll come back around 2 p.m. for plenary two. And then after that, we will have a little signing. If you would like to buy a book, Caroline is also out there. So go ahead and buy a book now or later, whatever you want to do. Um, thank you. See you next week. Would you get my scooter? I just want to stand and stretch. So you can talk to me if you get my scooter. <laughs> What's your name? Okay. Thank you. And I am an outreach 